Hi everybody, this is A7X Fan Ben with God Mason, and this is Pirate CSG Podcast episode number 35. So tonight we're going to be talking about Return to Savage Shores. It's the set review episode for that set, and this was the final set ever designed by WizKids, although it was not released. So before we go any further, just a big notification that if you don't already know, this set does not exist in physical form. It was never produced. Uh, WizKids got shut down only five days after Savage Shores came out. So Return to Savage Shores was designed, but it was never printed. So you can't collect this set. So we have it up in the master spreadsheet right now. You can find a link to that in the description for this podcast or the post, wherever it is. And we've also got some information from the Wikipedia page. It was supposed to be released sometime in early 2009, but although it was never released, we have to thank Wolf for releasing the information in 2012. So he actually went public because he was the rules arbitrator and worked with WizKids. So he went public with the information on the set back in 2012 with a bunch of uh, sneak flashback threads at Miniature Trading. And I've got a link to those in the description as well if you want to check out his original thoughts on the set and see kind of the, the actual releasing of the info back then when it first came out. So thank you to Wolf for, for providing us with another good set, really. It's it's a lot like Savage Shores, same distribution um, idea and the same size. And it's basically kind of like a clone set with like different ships and crew with the same numbering scheme and everything like that. So overall, it's a good set, though, as we're going to find out pretty soon. Mm -hmm. I would like to add that there were a few pieces of art that sort of leaked out from this set through an artist's webpage. The person who drew the portraits for Savage Shores also drew portraits for Return to Savage Shores. I believe I saw a theory that the sets were split into two after yeah. originally being designed as one. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, and you can actually see I released the official WizKids documents from Wolf earlier this year as well. And... Um, and yeah, you can see that's where some of the unreleased stuff came from because there were there was stuff that was going to be in Savage Shores when it was a full size set, and then when that got split, some of it just never showed up even in Return to Savage Shores. So yeah, it was going to be all one set, and then they split it, and half of it never even saw the light of day. So, yeah. which is almost a good thing when we get to a couple of these. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. All right. Cool. Yeah, might as well start Keep things going. off here. Uh, number 001 in the set is a rare cursed sea monster. It's a squid. Prolth is the name. It's 19 points, 5 segments, 2 cargo, L move. Cannons are 2S, 3L, 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 2S. And along with the sea monster keyword, it says this sea monster gets plus 1 to its boarding rolls. If it succeeds at a boarding party, it also eliminates a mast. So this one is just yet another kind of kind of mass sea creature. The cost is too high to make it viable. The speed is too slow to really get into action in a in a meaningful way. And overall, it's it's the ability is just jack up the point cost without being you know all that great. So not a great not a great sea creature at all. Better than Pay A the the first ship in the Savage Shores set, but still not a great one even for the cursed. Yeah, I mean I've seen worse, but that doesn't mean that it's great. Yeah. It's it's just too expensive. It might be functional at 14 or 15 points, but then again, that's a little cheap for the amount of offensive potential you're getting there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next up is number two. This is a pirate sea monster. This one is Lass's Lament. 14 points, five segments again, one cargo, L move, two 2S two tentacles, and then three 3S. And the ability text reads, Sea Monster. As part of a move action, the sea creature can initiate a boarding party against a ship up to S away from her without having to ram. Okay, it's basically S board. Yep. Eh, I mean, the armament's all right, but this is sort of another case of it's probably a little bit too expensive for what you're getting. I would say maybe 12 points would make it worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fair. I do like, I haven't used this one yet, I do like the idea of staying submerged and then um, surfacing as you use S-board. So you could stay submerged, move L, and then use S-board to almost get an extra range on your attack in a way. But other than that, I don't know, it's just another boring sea creature, another boring squid for the most part. So not really one yeah. you want to use either. Probably be be yeah. better, better than Krolth, just because the, you know, five points cheaper, but still not very good, so... 
Yeah, more mildly interesting than anything else. Yeah. The next one is quite fascinating, actually, and one of the standout pieces from the set. Uh, the cursed uh, sea creature. This one is a sea serpent, so a four master. Namazu is 15 points, four segments, two cargo, S move. All four cannons are 3S. And along with the sea monster keyword, it says, give the sea monster a shoot action. A wave S wide and 2L long leaves the sea monster in one direction. Up to two masts of every ship in the path of the wave are eliminated. Eliminate one of this sea monster's masts. So this one is quite interesting, has a lot of offensive potential. It's really slow and still kind of pricey for what you're getting, but you are getting a potent offensive weapon. I've actually used this one a few times. I used it to win a fleet challenge that El Cazador hosted, and then I used it to devastating effect in Command the Oceans last year. And this one is amazing because you can stay submerged and then pop up when you want to give it the shoot action to blast a wave out. And it gets really nasty if you combine it with like an admiral action, um, like any ship in your fleet can be given an extra action to get two waves. And you could, you could conceivably send them in different directions, so almost like a broadside from both sides, or you could do two waves in the same area in the front to knock out four masts from any ships um, in the path of the wave. So the possibilities are really amazing with this one. It's another great candidate for the L boosters, because with S speed it's not very fast, but with an L booster or even two, you could maybe stay submerged, move SLL, getting an extra action from somewhere else and then pop up and blast enemies with a huge tidal wave. So this one, and it was also pretty effective in economy edition back in 2015. Um, but anyway, this one, uh, it's really interesting and I would say worth the points actually. So one of the best sea monsters or at least the most interesting, even if not quite as practical as some of the fast ones. I initially didn't think all that much of it, but, as soon as you pointed out how valuable it can be in dense battlefields, especially when you're playing, say, a campaign game of any sort, yep. then it can be possibly one of the most underpriced units ever released. Yeah. Um, I don't think I have anything more to add to it because you have used it and I have not. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to skip on to Slippery Devil, number four. This is an American counterpart to it. It's another Sea Serpent, so four segments, 16 points. 2 cargo, S plus S move, 3L, 3S, 4S, 3L armament, and then the ability text reads, Sea Monster, if this ship succeeds at a boarding party, it also eliminates a mast. This is pretty unexciting to me. The armament isn't actually all that good. The ability is, again, not all that good. It's not slow, but this is... It's more expensive than some pretty good four masters from this set, but less effective. I would say you could get away with this at nine or ten points. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, Slippery Devil is boring. It reminds me of Champ, the 17 point serpent the Americans got in OE, which also yeah. has a boarding ability of some kind. So, not quite a clone, but another uninspired, like boring American creature that didn't really need to be created in the first place. So, not an exciting one. So,. Of the four creatures here at the beginning, Namazu by far the most interesting and the most effective. So, But now we're into the hoist, so it will get better here quickly. The Spanish got another hoist in this set, Rosinante, and this is an 18.3 master, 7 cargo, S plus S move, all three cannons are 4S, and along with the hoist keyword, it has secret hold, so you can't steal the treasures, and the ship can't be pinned. So this one is quite great, I think. Uh, not quite the frontier, of course. But this one is still a very good ship overall. So just another gold runner. We already talked about how great hoists are in the Savage Shores uh, set review. But they, they're kind of overpowered, if anything. And I think they're extremely viable, even in small games. You put a Helmsman on this, and you have a great gold runner for just 20 points. You've got plenty of room left for more stuff. And I don't know. It's just a, it's a great ship. So I guess with uh, Can't Be Pinned and Secret Hold, you could go after kind of a boarding strategy. But... I would probably just try to keep her safe and just make as much of a profit as possible off regular gold running. Yeah, I don't think she's well-armed enough, quite big enough, uh, quite fast enough to be an interceptor or a boarder. I would almost certainly keep her to a very fast gold running role. And I th I'd say she's sort of a discount frontier, a little bit cheaper, not quite as good, but 
nonetheless, that makes her one of the best gold runners in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, we can't say the same about the next hoist down, which is an American, USS Strongarm. This one comes in at 17 points, 6 cargo, L move, 3S, 3L, 3S, hoist with broadsides attack. I know what WizKids was trying to do. They were trying to make a sort of hybrid ship here, but it did not work. This is too expensive. It's not offensively all that valuable. You're going to want to use a hoist for gold running, and frankly, it's not going to be it's not going to be dangerous enough to really dissuade anybody who goes after it. The cannon ranks are too high to be useful for broadsides of attack, but that keyword okay, rank costs way. Yeah, um, let me, let me, yeah, let me. We're having a weird audio issue with Skype. I don't know why. Skype got like an update or something. So I'm doing a, a setting adjustment, and that should do the trick. Hopefully, we won't have to change it at all. But um, I think it's better now, at least. Huh. Better now? Yeah. All right. I guess what I was probably saying when my voice started to go fuzzy was that WizKids wanted to make a powerful hybrid like they wanted to do with uh what was the what was the british one from the last set i'm i'm blanking here uh maui's fish hook I mean, maui's fish hook, yeah. yeah they wanted to like maui's fish hook make it an expensive small hybrid but it just doesn't work not fast enough uh broadsides attack doesn't work with rank three guns doesn't work with l range guns either um it's not fast it is on the small side as far as cargo goes but it's not all that cheap uh, I think this honestly would come in at like twelve or thirteen points. It's just not very good. Yeah, I think it's still a solid ship. I think that would be a little too low of a cost, but I agree that it's not special for a hoist. There's a a bunch of hoists that are better than it, um, and the frontier, of course, being much better. But I agree that her offensive value is quite limited. I think it would be worth going after as a hybrid with rank two cannons. That would be much more interesting. But as is, it's kind of a weird in-between. So yeah. mostly hoists know what they're doing. They know that they're gold runners and not gunships at all. This one starts to blur the line, but then that actually hurts her potential because, she's like you said, the cargo is lower, and she's not as good at fighting as you want her to be. So although she could play a hybrid role, I would only want to do that in high-point games. Um, you don't want her to be the primary gunship or hybrid in, a, in an American fleet even. Uh, they've got Providence and Roanoke, other fleet, other ships to do that role better. So a strong arm, just kind of a weird one. It just kind of feels strange to try to force the hoist to be a hybrid. So kind of an ish- interesting concept, but execution is kind of lacking. So Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. A rank two set of guns would make her really good, um, unfortunately. Also, that base move really hurts her because it puts her on the slower side. I guess you could say the strong arm skipped leg day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the next one is the Abot. That's a French galley. So it's a one-masted galley, eight points, three cargo, L plus S move, two S cannon, and along with the galley keyword, when this ship carries no cargo, she gets plus S to her base move. I like ships like this a lot. They're just really basic empty gold winners. So you move out LSS, grab three coins, come back at L plus S, and on top of that, you've even, even got a good cannon if you need it, which you probably won't get a chance to use it, but... You know, a solid ship here overall, so the French get yet another good gold runner. Yep, this one isn't, you know, exceptional for their gold runners, because you can also get Le Afrique. Uh, no, yeah, I'm thinking the wrong one. No, Slint Trick B. I Yeah, this is just stupid. We're going to have to, like, complain to Skype or something. I don't understand this. All right, I fixed, I changed it back, so hopefully it's better now. Um, hopefully we'll okay. get to get through the podcast. Yeah, it's better at least. Okay, I agree with what you said. It's it. They have some better ships, but this one is it's simple and it's effective, and that's about all there is to say about it. It's a one master. Um, the next ship down is a pirate one master called Plague of the South, completing the northwest, east, south thing that was going on. I think it started in China Seas. This one is ten points, one masted galley, five cargo. S plus S plus S base move, 3S gun, and then plus one to cannon rolls against any non-pirate ship. Well, this is quite clearly one of the best gold runners in the game because it's got an incredibly fast base move, huge cargo. Um, 
I say the ability is kind of superfluous. It's yeah. a bit expensive, but it's but it's just excellent. You can put a helmsman on, and then from there you can add more crew if you want, but you don't have to. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. The only thing I find kind of annoying is that it's there's no one masters that exist that have more than four cargo. So I feel like they kind of broke the scale here, and it it just kind of annoys me that like the Bruja is a four master with two cargo. Lord Algernon, five mass, three cargo. This one, one mass, five cargo. Like, it just doesn't make physical sense based on the cargo hold of the ship. Yeah, that's why I don't like this one. And, of course, the pirates get it, you know. Like, they always get the best small gold runners, almost always. So, I yeah. find it, it, it's great. It's just kind of annoying. It kind of breaks the scale. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So, whatever. But yeah, yeah, you look at her on the surface, and you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. 80% of the ship is underwater. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe after I sink her, she will be. Um, that's true yeah and all you need to do that is really ram it because it's a one-masted ship yep um and then the next one we get into a couple four-masted galleys the elfil fleta is the first one this is an english four-masted galley 16 points four cargo s plus l base move cannons are 3s 4l 3s 4l along with the galley keyword she has captain built in the ship can move and shoot using the same move action and the ship gets plus one to reporting roll. She gets plus and two instead if her opponent is a sea monster. This is kind of a weird, like, auto hybrid. Like, when I say auto, you don't have to add any crew. And she's pretty much good to go as a hybrid, which is really quite strange. Um, and not many ships, only like USS Stevens, that's captain built in, I think. So this one, although her guns aren't great, I think she has solid potential. I would probably want to put a helmsman on, maybe an explorer. Or, you know, the English have some good crew to use. You could do a cap... Well, not really. You could do a world hater of some kind if you wanted to. Like Commander Spencer Portland. But... Or no, he doesn't have world hater. I don't know. I guess it's basically just a weird... It's kind of a weird hybrid that's maybe best with pretty much no crew. Which is strange. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good summation of it. It can run gold because it does have good cargo. And you're cutting into that if you start putting on crew... The most valuable crew for hybrids or warships would be a captain, which this doesn't need. If you really want, you could maybe go helmsman or some kind of named crew, like you said, a world hater. But this is one that's best kept simple, and one that I think honestly should probably be a point or two cheaper. Because the guns aren't very good for what you're paying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The English definitely have... A lot of options for four acid hybrids, and this is on the expensive side of them. Yep. Um, next up is a French competitor. This is also a four masted galley. This one's called the Sirene. This is 15 points, three cargo, S plus L move, 3L, 4S, 4S, 3L guns. So basically the opposite of the Alpha Fleta. This one, okay, this ship can't be shot at by ships with an S of her. So it's basically a... Uh, it's a hybrid between Nubian Prince and Le Bonaparte. Yeah, exactly. Which, by default, makes it really good. The guns aren't excellent, but galleys are like so big that it's hard not to be within S of it. It's pretty quick. It doesn't need excellent cargo or guns, really, just because of the ability. This is another OP ship that maybe we should be grateful that we don't have to face. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like a galley version of the Bonaparte, which makes me not like her. So, yeah, overpowered. Or a French Nubian prince. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, overpowered and not really not really fun to face, and your opponents will not like you if you use it. So, yeah, just annoying. Um, and it's so similar to those that we talked about. There's not much more to say, really. Uh, but yeah. getting into the crew, uh, since the distribution is a little funky, we had the rares at the top, of course, like they did with the Cursed Seas sets. Spanish first Spanish crew is a rare Comandante Antonio de Silva, and we know him from Spanish Main, and I think Barbary Coast as well. This time he's a six point crew captain and musketeer, so captainier you could call him uh, for the combo. So it's nice it saves a cargo space. You get two generic crew abilities in one. Musketeer is not that good though, so I'd probably go with um, Alfonso. Uh, De Castilla from Frozen North, Captain and Crew Killing for five. If I wanted like a named captain for relatively low points, that would give me good bang for my buck. And I think one other version of Silva, yeah, the first version is a two point crew killing, so that's probably a little bit more effective than this. They've got 
they've got plenty of good crew, so it's a solid one, just not, not one I would really prioritize in terms of Spanish named crew. Yeah, I they've got some decent named captains. Uh, I think we both agree that musketeers are overpriced. Yep. If this were five points, he'd be better. At six points, he's okay, but only in some niche situations. Yeah. And even then, there may be preferable options. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, there is a Spanish turtle ship. I don't remember what it's called or how much it costs, whether he, he can even go aboard it. Yeah. I can't remember. El Minnow, maybe? Uh, there's a few. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Um, might be worthwhile, but... Let's skip on to George Washington LeBeau, who is back for the first time, I think, since Davy Jones' curse. Yeah. So he so he took a long time to come back. He is a rare American crew, six points. And his ability is, instead of giving this ship an action this turn, you can give another ship in your fleet two actions. So he is the American Lord Micron, and for that reason, he's kind of broken, overpowered. Yep. Doesn't need to exist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, GWL, as he's often called by Derek's and I in our campaign games. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's been involved in... <laughs> as opposed to GWLB. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we could do that. George um, W. LaBush. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, he's been involved in some of the Vassal campaign games already. You know, we've already seen what he can do with Micron, so yeah, overpowered. And kind of a, a mistake, really, by WizKids. Uh, the next one is headhunter and he's back to being a pirate so he went cursed in uh djc after being a pirate in his first appearance in south china seas here he is a six point crew again the headhunter has if this ship wins a boarding party she can either take as much treasure from the other ship as she wants up to her available cargo space or she can eliminate all the other ship's crew so it's kind of a combination of hoard or hoarding gold and the massacre ability to kill all the crew so we, we already saw that i guess with the D- DJC version of him that links to the Guichuan. So, basically already seen it, but the pirates getting it you know, just makes them even richer. Although his first pirate version is better. It's like World Hater and Sack for just six points. So, this is not the better pirate version of the Hand Hunter, but that being said, Horde is usually at least five points, and WizKids overpriced the Massacre ability at like, sometimes seven. So, mm-hmm. to get the option of either, uh, rather than just one for six, is still a pretty solid deal. Not a great crew, but still somewhat useful on very large ships. Yeah, this is this is one that, again, I want to be a little bit cheaper because it's so hard to use that ability, uh, well, that combination really, to its max. I think there are probably a few ships that it would work on, but for the most part, you're probably better specializing than picking something flexible but expensive like this. Yeah. Um. I agree. His other variants are probably better as a whole. Um, Would he technically link to... Oh, great. Yeah, my dad's back to... uh, Hold on. Two seconds. Um, I I I think I'll sum it up by saying his other versions are better, and you should probably use them instead. Although I do wonder if he would link to the other links that the headhunter has. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, the next, I think with the, the Guichuan, it would just get kind of awkward in terms of trying to set it up, but the next one is Tobias Huntington, an English crew, and he links to HMS Goodfellow, which we'll see soon. He's a five-point English crew. Choose a ship with an S of this ship. If there are any unique treasures on that ship, that ship's controller shows them to you. This ship can load one unique treasure from that ship, if able. This is quite overpriced. Uh, we saw similar ability on Rolando and others for four points where you have it's basically UT Horde could be like an abbreviation so if this ship is touching other ships she can load as much unique treasures as she can carry so this one uh, you can be with an S so you don't have to touch which is nice because you might not lose a boarding party but you can only load one so Huntington should be like two points um, I don't know why this is so expensive this set, if anything, is underpriced for a lot of the game pieces, but here they just really messed up, and I don't, I don't think I've used them yet. I don't think I really plan to. Yeah, I think this style of ability is. I think it exists solely so you can counteract um, UT heavy strategies in big games, but aside from that, you're never going to use them. Yeah. 
Um, next down is an English ship. We're getting back into ships. These are the uncommons from the set. It starts off with an English four master called HMS Halcyon. It's an 11 point four master with four cargo, S plus S move, 2S, 2L, 2L, 2S guns, and then its ability is when the ship sinks another ship, you can repair one of this ship's masts. So basically, what you're getting here is an even better version of HMS London, yeah. which is already one of the most underpriced ships ever released. So I'd say this could, this would still be pretty good at 14 points. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's basically the London with a better or more fitting ability, as has been talked about a bunch of times before. So yeah, yeah. get another great English uh, large gunship. Because they absolutely needed more of those, didn't they? <laughs> well, it's nice. Represents like the ro- real life Royal Navy power to some extent. So still that's great. true. Yeah, Royal Navy power creep. Oh yeah, love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the cursed are next with the Black Coral. This is another uncommon four master. 15 points, 4 cargo, S plus S move, cannons are 4S, 3S, 3S, 4S, and it has secret hold, and this ship gains the eternal keyword as long as she has a crew with the captain keyword or captain in its name. So this is a really interesting ship. I find her rather fascinating. Um, I would do captain and helmsman and just run her as a semi-basic hybrid, because the curse don't have many ships with, you know, the combination of solid cargo, solid speed, and secret hold built in. So that makes her a candidate to get gold, but then you want to get that eternal and you know you don't it's not a great gold runner on its own. So I would still want to do a captain. So I'd do Captain Helmsman and just leave some cargo open and then I'd have Eternal as well. So Eternal and Secret Hold kind of a nice kind of a kind of a weak defensive hybrid in a way, but still a really fascinating ship. I like this one and I can't wait to try her out with different crew combos yeah this yeah. is uh this is one i'd want to use with a named captain just because she's on the expensive side yeah. um i i think you're right though that plus helmsman would be the best combo any more than that and you might be wasting the secret hold ability um but uh wait for clarification does secret hold protect crew no just the gold oh, okay well then yeah, I think any more than that, you'd probably be wasting Secret Hold. Um, yeah, this is one that I think wants to be a little bit cheaper, but because of its abilities, it can't be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, next up, we're moving into the Native Canoes. Um, another three sets. This time, there are English, French, and Pirate, as opposed to Spanish, American, and Cursed in the first set. Uh, the first are English. They come in at 12 points, one cargo apiece, L plus S move, 3S gun, and then their ability is give the ship a move action, but do not move her. Instead, roll a D6. On a result of 6, you may repair one mast on ships with an S of any native canoes. I can see this being abused, but I think you have a better idea of how. Yeah, yeah, this one is super fascinating. Uh, I still haven't really used them at all. I'm kind of shocked I haven't. I had a plan to launch them in Vassal Campaign Game 2, but it ended before I could go crazy with that idea. Um, So it's really bizarre. I still kind of can't wrap my head around some of it. I'm pulling up Wolf's uh, original thread on this idea. So the big news back in 2012, that you could, and yeah, Shelob is the one that uh, got it. You can repair sea monsters, sea creatures with this ability because it's not a repair action. Um, but it gets really wacky because within S of any native canoes, that could be uh, not this English set. Uh, you could use other sets in the same fleet if it was multinational, or you no, could uh, accidentally repair enemy ships if their canoes are near their own ships that need repairs. It's really bizarre. Um, This is another one we could probably do a long, like, chunk about, but that being said, I would want to use them first, because I still don't have experience, so I wish I could say more, but they're just, like, it's like a wild west of, like, chaos with these and, like, confusion and rules hang-ups and, like, a lot of potential. Just, just, just kind of crazy to even think about, honestly. (laughs) Yeah, this is this is probably a candidate for that special episode of yeah. things to talk about at length. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Oh yeah, so I'm next. 
Uh, the French, so. French set of native canoes are nine points. Of course, one mass, one cargo, and S plus S move, three S cannons, native canoe keyword, and when this ship carries no cargo, she gets plus S to her base move. So this is a nice set. Not quite as good as uh, the Spanish or the American canoes in terms of gold running from Savage Shores. But that being said, a uh, nice empty gold running strategy where you've got five of them moving triple S, which is the fastest canoes can go without help um, from trade currents or whatever. So five of them moving out triple S, they come back at two S with, you know, five coins, hopefully. So a nice, a nice addition to the French fleet. And obviously they're making out pretty well in this set so far. Yeah, this is another really strong gold runner candidate. Um, Again, it's kind of weird because they're native canoes, but I think you could just slap the uh, the chieftain anywhere on another gold runner, and you could basically clear the entire board in a matter of turns uh, with this and some of the other French options, and some of them from this set. Yeah. Um, I guess there's not all that much you can do with them aside from that. Yeah. With small cargo space, and I guess the ability is conducive to gold running. I'm trying to have more to say, but I don't really. You've yeah, covered pretty, it pretty well. Yeah, just basic empty gold running, really. Yeah. yeah, so I guess I'll move on to the pirate ones, the last native canoes ever designed, to our knowledge. These were 11 points, 1 cargo, S plus S move, 4 S gun, can dock at an enemy island, load 1 treasure, and leave on next turn. So they're home island raiders. This one's really cool, but to me, they're not nearly dura uh, durable or fast enough to really make use of that. I think you're going to see all these get mowed down because I don't even think making contact with an enemy ship counts as a ram. I think basically somebody could take a ship that moves 3S and run these all down in one turn. Yeah, well, you, you still have to shoot at them to sink them. They don't sink automatically like the turtles do, but... Okay. But, you, you're, but you're right, though. This actually, that happened in Vassal Campaign Game 1, where my Cursed uh, had an issue with Xerix's pirates. The pirates launched, it was crazy, because in a campaign game, you can launch them near an enemy home island, because they were launched after the start of play. So we launched <laughs> three different sets from the three wild islands near the Cursed home island, but none of them were able to steal any coins, because the Cursed just got their gunships into action and just took them out. Basically, all 15, there were three sets, so... It was a cool play, but it didn't work. So the biggest problem here is the speed and the cost. So they're kind of prohibitively expensive, and they're a bit slow for what you need them to do. So I do think and they're... And not durable uh, enough. Yeah, yeah, of course. I do think they're quite interesting. I think they're one of the more underrated sets of native canoes, maybe. But you have to really protect them and make up for the speed somehow to make them worthwhile. So this is another one... They got used a little bit in uh, Economy Edition in 2015 as well, but that was a weird situation. So I'd like to use them more, but again, like with the English ones, hopefully I'll have more to say in a long time mm -hmm. from now. But I do have a lot to say about the next one, because this is one of my favorite ships in the set, and mm -hmm. it's a Spanish common ship. We're into the commons now. Number 020, Colector del Dia, is an 11.3 masted junk. It's Spanish, and 6 cargo, S plus S move, Cannons are all 3L, all three of them. And along with the junk keyword, once per turn, the ship can move S after loading cargo. This is a fantastic hybrid. I would do Captain Helmsman, maybe Explorer. I mean, there's a ton of great Spanish name crew you could use. You could use Luis Zuan, either version, like 2-point Captain or 7-point Captain World Hater. If you wanted to go more of an aggressive route, Dominic Freda would be great on this ship. There are so many great options. Um, so this one reminds me a lot of the Cazador del Pirata from Spanish Main way back in the first set, which is very similar, just has L speed and a pirate hating ability. So this one is even better. It's like an upgrade from that, kind of like the Halcyon is upgraded London. So this one is just a fantastic hybrid. I think she's one of the most underrated ships in the game. I have, you know, I've talked about her a lot, but other people kind of miss, I don't know, I think she's just really great. So, this is one that I would compare to, uh, I don't think it's Casador del Pirata. Uh, what is that one Spanish three-masted junk? It's been a while. Um, it was Virtuous an SE, Virtuous Wind. Yep. This reminds me of the Spanish Virtuous Wind, but mm -hmm. almost slightly cheaper. Um, more cargo, I think slightly... Uh, was, was the Spanish version of Virtuous Wind S plus S or S plus L? 
Uh, S plus S for the Spanish version. Okay, so you're getting this for slightly cheaper with a bit more cargo. Guns aren't quite as good, but it still has a useful ability. Yeah. Those two together, I think, would be really an excellent pairing. Um, I like this one a lot. It does everything pretty well. It's really a very good gold runner on its own, but it can defend itself. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very fine ship overall. Amen. Um, who knows if uh, the next ship is quite as fine. This one is Mongrel. This is an American three-masted junk. This is 13 points, four cargo, S plus S move, 2S, 3L, 2S, and let's see. Ability, of course, junk. This ship is within S of a friendly ship. When given a move action, she gets plus S to her base move. So I guess pretty decent. Can be pretty quick. Would work as a hybrid. Um, I guess like all small American ships, she's on the expensive side. But I guess this is probably one of the few occasions where a small American ship is worth using. Yeah, I, she's mid-size. I wouldn't call it three master small. Well, but, smallish. Yeah. Yeah, but okay, I, that's fair. Yeah, I think she's another good hybrid candidate. More of an aggressive one than the Collector, though. More more biased towards uh, fighting than gold running. But this one I used in Vassal Campaign Game 3 a bit. It was a weird situation where she was just running gold, actually. But it can actually be really good in that uh, capacity, especially with a lot of other gold runners around in a larger game, because I had a Helmsman. And that she was almost always within S of a friendly ship. I almost always had that happen. So she was moving 4S with three cargo available, which is quite good for a three master, quite fast. And then she can easily fight and be a hybrid as well. So she's good as part of a larger battle group, kind of a fun support hybrid. So she can move 4S up to 4S with a good Captain Humpson combo, two cargo open. So very good possibilities here. Not quite as amazing as the Collector, but still quite a good ship with a high max speed potential. So another mm -hmm. good ship, no doubt. And the next one is pretty solid. French ship, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, Nor do I. Uh, okay, cool. But Renard uh, Isle? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so it's a two-masted French junk, 11 points, three cargo, uh, S plus S plus S base move, so very fast. Both cannons are 2S, and the junk keyword, and once per turn, as part of a move action, this ship can randomly take one treasure from any ship us up to S away from her. So kind of an upgrade of filching gold, so you don't even have to touch. So you can you can just be with an S and then get swing over or whatever and take some gold. So this one is a very nice little pest. So I would do a captain and nothing else. Uh, leave some space open for gold. You've got speed and cannons to not need those to be augmented at all. So this is a great little mini hybrid. A little pricey, I guess, for what you get. She's pretty fragile for an 11-point ship. But overall, another good French ship. Yeah, I mean, uh, this one kind of bugs me because the cargo space is usable, the move is great, guns are good, but the ability is pretty poor and the cost is high. So I would, while I want to use it as a gold runner, there are cheaper, better options for the French, and I think it's a little small and expensive to use as a I think it's a little small for a gunship at that price. Yeah. Uh, the ability is not effusive to it. I think the ability uh, works pretty well. I don't know. I, it's nice because I, I, I suppose so. As a, as you said, a, a small sort of more pest than anything. Yeah. It, I, I think what I'm doing is I'm thinking with the small game mentality because I have yeah. only played forty point games. Mm -hmm. But in larger games, I can see this being a decent contribution to a bigger battle group. Yeah, yeah, she might fly under the radar more. Um, but yeah, 14 points in a 40-point game would be a bit much for the fragility. I just like how the ability, um, you could swing by and shoot a couple masts off and take a treasure and then board after if your shots go well, um, stuff like that. Or I like how you could also avoid getting pinned by taking the treasure without having to touch it all. It's a pretty nice thing to have. So although she could be, like, maybe 9 points would be about right. So still a little pricey, but... It's kind of like yeah, nine points sounds right to me. Yeah, she's strong in pretty much every category except for the cost is a little pricey for how fragile it is. So, mm -hmm. all right. Next, um, yeah. Yep. Another nation gets a two message junk in this set. This would be the pirates. It's Cuerno de la Cabra. This one is also eleven points and three cargo, but this one has L move and two L guns. 
Its ability is two hits from the same, same shoot action are required to eliminate one of the ship's masts. I like that ability. I like the armament. Um, it's probably still uh, maybe one point too expensive. Maybe. Um, it's a little slow, but it will have great crew selection because it's a two master. You can't knock it out with one ramming hit. I, I sort of like this, and I think I would want to use it. Okay. Yeah. I don't like her nearly as much as the previous ship, but she's okay as like a dreadnought, small dreadnought type ship. I would probably do yeah. Captain Helmsman and then try to max out the armament with like a Marine or a Musketeer, something like that. Or even Hammersmith yeah. plus Cannoneer plus Musketeer have up to like four die rolls per shoot action, something like that. So yeah, she's all right. Just kind of, I don't know. I feel like ramming would be a problem and the damage output is still kind of low for, for what she is. So that's all right though. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, no, I don't have any more to say. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, the next one is a curse three master, the fairy fire. Fairy spelled F A E R I E. Um, so it's a 15.3 master, three cargo, L MU, cannons are 2S, 3L, 2S, and the ghost ship keyword. So this one is just kind of a overpriced, like average gunship. I don't know. She's not too exciting. Ghost ship jacks up the cost, but doesn't really make her that much more effective. So I don't know. Just Captain Helmsman, maybe one more crew. And she's just kind of a cursed, like numbers ship in a larger game, but you would never really prioritize her in smaller games so not really too exciting yeah this is yeah this is just another ship where ghost ship is far too expensive almost all her stats are really average i guess she has decent guns but her cargo and base move are super dull she is not worth 15 points i would say also ghost ship doesn't really work on anything that moves i'd say slower than s plus l anyway uh, sure, you could get her to that with the Helmsman, but you shouldn't have to. Uh, with S plus L, she'd still be kind of a hard swallow. But as is, I would say she's probably worth 10 or 11 points. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yep. Yeah, just not an exciting ship. Uh, I, I think your appraisal was right. Just something to sort of spend your points on if you've got them. Yep. Uh, next down is HMS Goodfellow. This is English, surprise, with the HMS name. This is a 12-point schooner at two masts and five cargo. S plus S move, both 4L guns. The link is to Tobias Huntington, the above not-so-great crew. Um, although, this is a schooner with a secret hold. So it's sort of like a slightly slower... This reminds me of HMS Lady Provost, but yep. not quite as fast, yep. not quite as much cargo, not quite as expensive either. Yeah, yeah, a little bit worse, kind of like a poor man's version of that ship. Um, Still kinda, decent, though. Yeah, no, I, I like her quite a lot, actually. It's kind of like a defensive version of the Lady Provost, because you've got Secret Hold versus Home Island yeah. rating for the Lady Provost is much more aggressive. Um the link is actually not too bad because Secret Hold could protect the UT that you you steal. But, of mm-hmm. course, Huntington, you don't really want to use him, so whatever. Um, so with this one, mostly I would just do a Helmsman and let her go from there. So a solid English gold runner. They could use more of those, so they're happy to get the good fellow. All right. Mm-hmm. And then the next one is Hermosa, which is actually an American ship. It's a common uh, two-masted schooner. 13 points, two masts, three cargo. L move, the cannons are both 2L, and along with the schooner keyword, it says, once per turn, one of the ship's cannons can shoot again if it misses, so cannoneer built in. This is this feels like a ship from uh, Fire and Steel, like the Madness or some other junk. Um, it's yeah, really it just, does. Yeah, it's just stupidly oh. overpriced. It's like, they, it's like this might be a leftover from uh, Fire and Steel, just a super boring, overpriced two-master with um, somewhat average stats, especially with cargo and move. So um, I think I bet you points, it is. Yeah, I think seven points would work, but thirteen is way too high. Yeah, I think you're right about seven because there's way too much competition at eight for this to be worthwhile at that price. Even. Yep. It, yeah, it should be half the price. This is yep. kind of appalling. Um, you can't even really redeem it with powerful American crew like the Cargo Master because even then. You've got a slightly above average cargo space and a slightly below average move. Okay. So uh, I think much more interesting is the next unit on down. Uh, we're into the common crew now. This one is French. 
a return of Mademoiselle Josephine Godiva, who I think has, again, not been seen since Davy Jones' Curse. In this set, she comes in at two points because she's a two-point reducer. Um, I don't know if she... She doesn't have a link this time. Um, uh, do the French already have one of these crew? Uh, not that I remember. I'll look it up on an MT, but I don't know. Okay, if not, then I suppose she would have been a worthwhile addition. Although, again, two-point reducers are generally kind of a niche-use crew, so I can't really see her being all important. But if she's filling a gap that the French had, then I can't really fault her for that. Yeah. Yeah, she's okay. Um, the other version is like a Zero Limit Ransom re-roller, so... That yeah, which is much better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they also got another one of those with La Fontaine. So, mm -hmm. so you could say this one is still kind of interesting uh, for them. And trading is a little tiny bit slow, so let me just make sure I go to the French here to find out if they got any crew with this ability. Overall, two producers are extremely niche. Once in a while, you'll find a setup where it's perfect. But other than that, you'll never use them. Uh, yeah, they do have uh, Philippe Dubrissac from uh, Crimson Coast. So there you go. Yeah. So Mademoiselle Josephine Godiva is redundant in both her forms. Yeah, just a clone, really. Um, yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, the next one is much more interesting. It's a Spanish crew on the same card, and it's Sebastian Rojo, a common crew, Spanish nine points, and Marine. And once per turn, you can eliminate one of the ship's crew to give her an extra action. So a sack marine. Sack marine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, pretty weird. I like how sack is three instead of two in this case. It's still too cheap, but whatever. Um Which is anyway. balanced by the fact that marine is way too expensive. Yeah, actually, yeah, it, it does work out okay, because I guess marine should be I mean you could make a pretty good case for four points, so sack at five is a lot better than two or three. So yeah, the cost is is the cost is alright. It's not really underpriced necessarily, uh, for how good sack is. This is a kind of a bizarre crew in my opinion i've thought about trying to use them a few times uh it's just kind of it's a little weird i would use them on a large gunship probably a five master or maybe even larger if i can find a spot for them somewhere um it's just i don't know it's just a weird crew because if you think about the costing nine points you'll still need captain helmsman that's 14 plus at least two oarsmen ideally would be 16 so you're talking at least a 16-point ship. Double that to 32 total points. He's not going to be a good option in 40-point games, but kind of intriguing at higher build totals, especially like a deathmatch situation would be cool. I will say, as a Marine, he's not likely at all to be dumped on an island to protect it with the Marine keyword because Sack is just too valuable to leave on an island. Speaking of which, though, I have an idea, and I'm not sure this would work, but if it would, it might be worthy of a house rule. Yeah. So, hear me out. Mm -hmm. Put Sebastian Rojo on a Great Turtle. Put okay. a couple oarsmen on the Great Turtle. <laughs> then use Sack to move the Great Turtle multiple times, and then use the fact that you can't really fight Marines all that easily once they're on an island um, to essentially put Sebastian Rojo as a make the turtle a, uh, a gunship. Yeah. It's a cool thought. I'd just rather do it with a fork because it would be cheaper and probably a lot more effective. Um, I'm going to check right like now. In a fort. Yeah. Actually, I can just use them. What am I doing? I should just use the master spreadsheet. So use the miniature training. Um, can you give a fort multiple actions by putting Rojo no. and an Orisman on it? No, nah, because you got to remember it says, um, sorry, uh, you can only one of this ship's crew to give her an extra action. It's the ship mm. getting the action. So that's why yeah. I'm checking on the f turtle. Um, turtles are moved it, when you give up an action from elsewhere in your fleet. So, yeah, if no ships are docked at this island, give one of your ships a move action, but do not move her. So you can't use Rojo's sack on a turtle to move the turtle. So yeah. you're giving up a ship's mm -hmm. action, not his own. So. Yeah. But does it count uh, for, I mean, technically, you could use Rojo's sack on a ship and use the extra action to donate to a turtle. You could do that, but, yeah. But then why not commit the sacrifice on the turtle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, if you want to house rule it, you could do that. Make it some kind of weird sacrificial tribal event or something. <laughs>
I've actually got, that's ironic, because I made some customs today, one of them is called, like, Ceremonial Sacrifice, some stuff from Epic Seas, but... Uh, Does it involve a turtle? No, actually, maybe I'll have to try that next. Does it involve the turtle's UT? No, I'll, I'll maybe I'll make turtle ceremony or sacrificial turtle ceremony event or something. I don't know. Somebody out there make a turtle themed fleet. It has great turtles, turtle ships, the yeah, turtles oh. tea. Yeah, we talked about that. Derek's and I. Did we? The, well, well oh, we, oh, during the too. Savage Shores anniversary game, we had uh, great turtles, and it was they dominated the game. It was crazy. But anyway, that was one of the Earth. crackier games I've ever played. Um, and we, I think we talked about that during the live broadcast. It was like almost a two hour game. And yeah, we talked about how we could make a turtle ship based fleet using turtle ETs and great turtles. So turtle mania. There should be a purely wildlife focused, uh, fleet challenge where probably yeah. 40 points where people see if they can <laughs> assemble entire fleets out of say one animal like titans uh would have to have some sort of crab counterpart as crew or uts or oh, whatever okay, yeah. there was something yeah. similar actually um it was i think it was captain nemo i think it was golden nautilus or golden nautilus 2 i think it was mostly like animal or wildlife themed in general but i think it was just based on the names rather than what it, the actual game pieces were so yeah there was something similar though yep so many fleet challenges have already been run that, like a ton of ideas have already been submitted, so I think we're like I don't know, like seventy or eighty fleet challenges maybe in total. Something like that. And even more ideas that are still waiting in line. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I've got like four or five ideas. <laughs> yeah. I think I've written down a couple in time, but of course yeah. I haven't entered any recently, so the odds of me winning and uh being able to put one out there are kind of nil. Yeah. All right. Um Next up is an American crew. This is another uh, two-on-one card. This is Pierce Hollow. And I, I think he was in a prior set, but I don't remember which. Yeah, it's a girl, and she's from SCS. So was trying oh, okay. To yep. Pierce is a... That's an interesting name for a woman. Um, <laughs> still six points. Uh, Musketeer plus one to cannon rolls against English ships. <laughs> Um, we know how I feel about faction bonuses, and we know how both of us feel about the price of musketeers. Yeah, and it's think, crazy. You can't even use the bonus on the musketeer shot because it doesn't. Yeah, it's wonderful. It. It's still, it's still. I think I think this at most should have been again two points because I think faction bonuses are mostly useless and are more there for flavor than anything. Yeah. So I say two points and forget forget using it otherwise yeah i think three because i don't think you can get plus one against english for free but it's still way way yeah. just, just dumb it's not a good combo it's just very illogical so not fun um her previous version i think is another two point reducer so she's not very effective overall <laughs> she doesn't really help her fleets very much if she ever gets hired anyway so combine all those abilities and maybe she'll be worthwhile of six yeah, yeah, fair point. <laughs> All right, uh, the next one is a massive upgrade, and it's Cursed. Papa Doc is back after Davy Jones Cursed, his last appearance, um, on the same card as Pierce Hollow. This is an eight-point version, just like the first one, which was the possession ability, if you remember that one. But this version of Papa Doc has, this ship gets plus one to her boarding rolls, and even more importantly, once per turn, one crew ship with an S of this ship can't use its ability that turn, so you get cancel with uh, canceling with plus one to boarding rolls, great. So, amazing crew. This really is a huge boon for the curse because they, they could really use canceling crew. Um, just amazing. So, he often gets used on some of their 10 masters or at least five or six masters in some of the big games. And he's definitely going to be used for years to come in some cursed big fleets. Yeah. He'd almost be worthwhile for the cursed at eight points as just a canceler. Yeah. But the little bonus to boarding rolls, I'm sure, it doesn't help uh, deciding to use him. I'm kind of struggling to think of the perfect place to use him. Yeah. Uh, uh, possibly one of the cursed subs, just because I like those. Yeah. But those are not very good submarines. That's a good so. point. Lock Locker actually has the massacre ability, so plus one to boards would make her board at four essentially. So that's a solid solid idea. And then I think she's 13 points. Then you could do Captain Helmsman for 13 crew points. That makes a lot of sense. Good idea. Oh, well, thank you. And then, Although... 
And then I think, although I'm not sure how useful that would be. Yeah, no, it'd still be fun though. So merch canceling is quite effective, especially in long games. Um, mm-hmm. But then uh, Divine Dragon would work okay. Board from seven would be fun. On a ten master, it's kind of overkill, but you know that's a good place for a canceler in the first place. So I would usually put him on one of their two ten masters. Yeah, for a second I thought you meant um, the one masted oh, divine no. dragon, not the, because not there were the two most. of them. Yeah, not that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't quite work, and no. that's clearly not what you meant. Yeah. Um, next up is Countess Diana Dune, who is back for the first time since I believe Spanish Main, where I think she was was she a set character or was she promotional only? Uh, she's a she's a regular crew. I'm gonna go peek at it. She's um, a two-point reducer. And then I think she she showed up in Barbary Coast as a promotional crew. Let me just uh, make sure. Okay, yeah, she was promo in Barbary Coast. That would yeah, explain it. Brother Virgil Link in SM as a two-point reducer. And then in Barbary Coast, she's got Captain, I think, and then plus one. Maybe, man, I really want to know now. Oh, no, I think she was, like, a weird clone because it was, like, really ineffective. I remember this now, yeah. She's actually a plus... She's a re- zero-limit ransom re-roller in Burberry Coast. So, kind of strange. That's there. pretty good, yeah. but... But I'd say this version is actually better. No, wait, no, Not no, wait, never mind. <laughs> um, no, this is the last of the two-per-card crew of the set, this version of Countess Diana Dune is 8 points. Once each time the ship is given an action, you may roll a 2d6. Anytime you'd roll a d6, choose a result you want to use. Um, wasn't there a retcon that basically allowed you to do this for every die roll? Uh, uh, say for cannon rolls? Not quite. I mean, Rupert Hargreaves has it only for cannons, but Wolf basically made it better than it originally showed up in the Pirate Code. Well, originally it was really bad. So he made it a bit better, but it's still not, like, every single one, which is a custom crew I think Xerox made or somebody. Um, so you have to make it custom to make it, like, every single die roll. But then it's, like, hmm. that's, like, really, it's almost, like, overpowered. So, I don't know. Well, as is, then this is effectively just a re-roller, but for eight points. And for that, no thanks. Never. Yeah, they already got... Yeah, they got... It's just a clone of Hermione Gold from Fire and Steel, which is pretty disappointing, so... Yeah, but this is also practically just a re-roll anyway. Mm, yeah, I mean, you can still use it multiple times in a turn. You just have to, like... You, you gotta, like, do a lot of stuff, like boarding, um, ramming, stuff like that. So it's, okay, it's okay, never mind. Yeah, it's not worth eight points, but it's, I don't know, Wolf made it a little better with the Pirate Code update a while ago, maybe the 2011 Pirate Code, but it's still not good enough to be worth eight points. So, um, and then on the back of the card, we got a Pirate Crew, Wall-Eyed Worthington, for two points, <laughs> and uh, once per I turn, wish I could have seen his artwork. Yeah, <laughs> once per turn, the ship can look at one face-down cargo on any ship. But they already have that for Lucky the Parrot for one point in Spanish Main, so... And he just, has a link to someone else as well. Yeah, he's just a downgrade. Yeah, it bones Wiley, David Wiley. Yep. Yeah, he's just uh, overpriced. Not not OP. Um, yeah, just a reverse power creep. Cost increase, so not a good one. Yeah, just kind of... Yeah. Um, we're getting into the UTs now. Uh, which we might find some interesting stuff here. Uh, the first one is number 30, Tiki of the Volcano. And what happens is when you find it, eliminate all but one crew from this ship. If there's a tribal chieftain on this ship, you must eliminate only one crew from this ship. So, uh, I guess a very RTSS and Savage Shores themed uh, UT, but... Mm, eh. I guess, really, when it comes to negative UTs, you're going to compare everything to Missionary or, say, uh, Wolves. You're going to basically compare all the negative UTs to the worst ones. And if they're not as bad, you're not going to use them. Uh, And when it comes to positives, you're going to compare them to other. In this case, I mean, how comparable is this to Missionary? They're sort of effectively the same, right? Yeah, Missionary removes all the crew... So it's a bit better. And then Plague can be pretty decent too, although it can backfire. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. I'd say this is 
like a not quite as good missionary, but this yeah. plus missionary can be used in a fleet and then maybe play as well. Oh, God, that'd be rough. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess this is close enough to missionary and plague that it's probably worth using if you're trying to make an absolute minefield out of every wild <laughs> island. Yeah, that's rough. Wow, that's a good idea, though. <laughs> a good idea in case you want to have nobody to play with you ever again. Yeah, and it's the type of thing you can use to make a deathmatch fleet viable in a gold game. That's how. That's part of how my HMS Grand Temple fleet has won games against much better gold fleets. It's just a deathmatch 40-point fleet, really, but I've got missionary and wolves and whatnot, so it can sometimes slow down enemy gold runners so much that the Grand Temple catches them and I win by just sinking everything. So, anyway... <laughs> Um, so next one is Native Lore, another UT, and it says place three trade currents then, and then remove Native Lore from the game. So really basic, uh, trade currents, navigator is a little, eh, a little overpowered, so I don't know, it's, it's okay. I, I like Celestine's charts better because it knocks out all the trade currents. Um, so this is kind of the counterpart to that, the positive, you know, version in a way. So it's, it's good for gold fleets, of course. Yeah, this might be good for somebody who's also using Lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because then you can just lay down a ton of uh, trade currents for yourself if you really want. Yeah. Um, of course, you don't want your opponent finding it, but depends on the game you're playing. Um, next is Sea Star. And this one is load this treasure face down. When revealed, once per turn is a free action, roll a d6. On a result of five or six, repair one mast on this ship. So this would be really good on some kind of dreadnought in a big game, especially one that's seeing a ton of action. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's the Even type of thing. Even more so if you've got a reroll. Yeah, it's the exact type of thing you would keep secret and then transfer from a gold runner from like a one mast to a five mast or something like that. It could yeah. become really devastating on like the Accor's Auto because then your opponent might need two hits to take out a mast and then you repair one. It's like you're almost like repairing two masts in a way, so... Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a solid one. You know, kind of like uh, Cross of Coronado, it's not one you would necessarily want on a Gold Runner. I mean, it could still be helpful, but better on a gunship for the most part. Although sometimes they run out of cargo space quickly with big crew setups. But anyway, next one is yeah. Abandoned Charts, which we saw briefly in the unreleased episode because it was talked about there too. And when this treasure is revealed, mark all wild islands as explored and choose any wild island and look at all the face-down treasure on that island. Then remove abandoned charts from the game. So you get to see everything, um, or not see everything, but mark it as explored, which is, I don't know, I find that kind of strange. But anyway, it's like a master map in a way. And then choosing one wild island would be fun. I haven't really used this one, I don't think. It's a little strange, but... I guess you could just pick the island with the most coins, or, I don't know, I guess maybe the one that your opponent is about to get to, to try to see what UTs they might get, or something like that, to strategize, like, value point values, and see if you might want to raid their home island later on, so, a lot of potential strategy, I just, again, like the English Native Canoes, I just gotta use it more to talk about it effectively. This is, to me, like an inverse of Maps of Alexandria, which shows everything but doesn't mark it as explored, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this plus that would be really good if you if you found this one, and it doesn't matter who finds uh, Maps of Alexandria or Pirate Globe, because they're the same. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I guess this one is sort of neat, but also sort of strange. Um Probably one to use if you are doing a gold running fleet, but otherwise probably doesn't matter that much. Yeah, yeah, it's decent. Um, pretty mostly friendly UTs. Three of the four are positive. Some of the Savage Shores UTs are pretty overpowered compared to these ones. They toned it down a little bit here. Um, pretty much all of them actually, because you got like Alter the Loa, Celestine charts, and Front of the yeah. can be kind of overpowered in a way too. So. Sea Star, I, I wanted to make one more small comment, yeah. especially with regards to that uh, Corzado thing. Mm -hmm. You said it would be like like repairing two masts per turn, but not if you have Joaquin Vega and yeah. they keep having to knock off the first mast because <laughs> then it would be like three a turn. Yeah, that that's rough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, um, next up were the you, not the, the generic crew. Uh, for some reason, they split them between uncommon and common, just a bunch of shipwrights. 
uh, the Spanish would have gotten a common generic cargo master. But again, that's not what's super important. We're going to jump into the super rares now, starting with number 41, Fito, which I think some people have heard of on the forum at least a few times because of how often Ben and Zerex talk about it. Uh, in general, this has one of the best super rare sets ever, if not the best. What would yeah. you say? Yeah, it's, it's close to the top. I'd have to consult my rankings list to, to remember, but yeah. True. As well as mine, of course. Mm. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but Fitu is a hoist, again. 16 points, 6 cargo, L move, 3S, 4L, 3S, linked to Lady Roy Mata, whom we agree is kind of OP. Yeah. Uh, this ability is if the ship has a crew with a captain keyword, she gets plus L to her base move. So it's pretty easy to take this ship to... L plus S plus L, uh, plus L, making this, uh, this is the fastest hoist in the game, right? Or? In terms of max speed, yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, I'd say that alone makes her pretty important. Uh, the armament isn't exceptional, but that can be pretty easily addressed with any kind of cannon boosters. Um, as a whole, this is a much better sort of hybrid hoist or even a gold runner in some ways than the strong arm and definitely better than it's not a Kualapu, it's uh it's Maui's fish hook yeah. yeah yeah this one is just incredible like you said lls pretty easily and he's still a four cargo hoist is basically automatic explorer and more and then i would just leave the cannons alone i wouldn't want to spend a cargo space on barb and ice to get world hater but yeah, she's a solid hybrid too. The captain is there more for the speed than to make her a hybrid. She's still a great gold runner, even with lower cargo once you add the crew. 16 points is kind of criminal for what you're getting. I think 20 would be fine, honestly. And uh, and yeah, I guess I'll just go to the link real quick. Lady Roy Mata is the linked crew for 6 points. You get Captain and SAT, also called Foreign Leader, once per turn before you give the ship an action, roll a d6 on a 5 or 6, the ship can be given the same action twice. So, pretty easily, for just 24 points, with Roymata and a Helmsman, you've got LLS doubled, so LLS plus LLS, potentially, uh, with 4 cargo open, basically Explorer built in with Hoist, or even more, almost like S Explorer. Uh, just incredible. And then you can add, just to make it even more ridiculous, you can easily add Godiva or La Fontaine for zero points to get the reroll on the SAT and make it even more likely that you would go wicked fast almost every turn. It's just insane. So, yeah, yeah one of the fastest, fastest ships in the game. Period. Yeah, exactly. Not only a fastest hoist, but one of the fastest ships. Period. So, <laughs> Ugh. all right. I guess I'll do the one master. Um, unless you have more to say about Romana and the V two. No, or, I don't. Yeah, yeah, just wicked good. Uh, para Rahe, uh, I don't know, that's how I think about it, but it's a six-point French one-masted sloop. It's got four cargo, S plus S move, two S cannon, and this ship eliminates two masts with one hit. So another very good ship here. This one, I don't really care much about the ability because one-masters don't make good gunships even with a nice ability like that. You're kind of tempted to do a captain and helmsman, but then you've got a one-master very fragile for 11 points. Still is probably going to get rammed out of the game if somebody catches her. So I would probably do... I mean, there's some interesting options. You could do just a Helmsman and run gold. That's a good option I would like quite a lot. Um, you could do Captain Helmsman for a hybrid. I guess you could try Roy Mata if you were really short on points and couldn't get the fee to. You could do Roy Mata with, for Captain and then SAT to make the speed better and to eliminate up to four masts in a turn if you hit both times. So... Some good possibilities here. I do find it interesting. She's very similar to the Hanuiki, the English two master from Savage Shores, which is a little bit more towards gold running for one point more, but stats are pretty much the same. So overall, the French, obviously, you can make a decent case they made out better than any other faction in this set. And the one master is often overlooked because of the Fee 2 Roy Mata combination, which makes a lot of sense. But this one master sloop is kind of a beast on her own, too. Yeah, she's a more than respectable gold runner. Again, she's got reasonable move, good cargo space, low cost. Um, 
I want to make use of the ability and the gun because they do pair together well. But uh, like you said, small ships, you know, one masters, they do not make good warships. Um, I, I'm struggling to come up with any way to really semi effectively make that work. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll read through. Did you already uh, read Lady Ramata? Yeah. Yeah. We talked about her. Okay, then I will read Eye of Maru, and for a while, the uh, photo attached to this UT was of Maru, the cat that jumps into boxes. Uh, this one reads, when this ship is given a shoot action, you may do- double the range of one of her cannons. And I really like this one, because to me, this is one that you could use with the sniping ability, you could use it with a bombardier. I... I like this one because it has some good uses, even though it's, you know, it's a good fun novelty is why I like it. Yeah. yeah That's all I need to say. Yeah, it is quite fun. And you could kind of, well, I guess it's not loaded face down, so not a big surprise, but you could use it on like the Endeavor or some kind of English gunships with those great two out cannons and just extend the range in general. So yeah, it's another one kind of like uh, the Sea Star that you would probably load with a Gold Runner and then transfer to a gunship if possible during the game. So another candidate for that, more of an offensive UT. Um, so that wraps up a great super rare pack. Um, so yeah, and I'll get my, let me get my rankings up here. I just want to see it here. What I, what I ranked the super rare pack in comparison to the other ones. I actually ranked Barbary Coast, and I ranked three of them above this one. I have this one. Yeah. Oh, wow. I have it only sixth. So, I don't know. I think it's because it's overpowered. So, in terms of pure effectiveness, maybe it would be top three or top four at least. But since it's OP, I was kind of downgrading it because it's too good rather than, like, perfect. You know what I mean? So, yeah. 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 All right. Uh, so that wraps up the super rare pack. And we're into the special edition ships, which, if the set was released, probably would have been in the uh, Return to Savage Shores scavenger pack boxes as, like, the window ship in those boxes. So the first SE is an English ship, and it's a two-masted catamaran, the Brazen. 14 points, two masts, four cargo, L-move, both cannons are 3L, along with the catamaran keyword, which is defensive in nature. It has the home island rating ability, so it can dock an enemy home island. And, oh no, it's Homeland Horde. Oh, it's great. This ship can document Homeland and take as much treasure as she can carry. So not just one coin. If able, she must leave on your next turn. So quite a nice uh, uh, ability there. And the Catamaran might help her escape by dodging some potential hits. Uh, obviously, the speed and cargo are a bit lacking for the 14 points. And, you know, Homeland Raider, uh, you're going to get, you know, attacked hard, probably. Especially because here you might take up to three coins, which gets into my combo with uh, Hermione Gold and Thomas Gunn would be perfect for the Brazen. So then you could have L plus S move, three cargo still available for Home Island Horde, as I like to call it. And then, uh, obviously, you could use the cannon. So it's not a great catamaran, not, not really a great, like, package, but with the right crew, I would probably add an oarsman as well, along with the Captain Helmsman combo crew. You could make, you could make a, a fun threat. Maybe not a very serious one, but still kind of kind of dangerous a little bit. So, it's a fun one. I, uh, I, I would say this is one of the few ships where Gentleman Jokard is almost a necessity. Yeah, like Ismail for the English. Uh, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah, just because he makes the... He augments the very powerful ability that the ship already has. Yeah. And, of course, we both agree on the helmsman. I'm not so sure about the captain. 3L guns, are they're all right. Yeah. But if you're going to pick this ship, you're going to pick it for the ability. Yeah, I would just want to use those. I think. Yeah, I would just want to use one of those combo crew. Then you get captain as well for the same cargo yeah. space that the Hamilton takes up, and then three L cannons might help you escape. So if you really wanted, you could do Hammersmith instead of Captain Helmsman. That's what I was saying. Oh, okay. Yeah, Thomas Gunn or Hermione Gold. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Then I was missing that part. Yeah. Um, oh wait. Oh, wait, no, not Hammersmith, because this is English. Yeah. I missed that somehow. I thought this was pirate. Um, then, yes, um, I wouldn't do the Trevor Van Tyne thing with Hermione Gold, though I like to, because he's a pretty decent deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think probably Thomas Gunn on this ship. Yeah. Um, 
that would be why I was hitting you with pirate crew this entire time instead yeah, of right. being Bush. <laughs> well, the next one uh, is pirate, so. <laughs> that's true. This one is Orphan, and I believe this is one of the most infamous ships ever released, or ever not released <laughs> yeah, okay. in this case. Uh, this is a 16-point double catamaran. This one, because double catamarans are three masts, has three masts, uh, which are 3S, 4S, 4S. It's got five cargo, S plus S move, and the ability is... If this ship is the target of a shoot action, the attacking player must first roll a d6. On a result of 1 to 3, this target can't be shot at, and the attacking player can give their ship another action. So there's a 50-50 chance that you can't even shoot at the ship, and then because of the catamaran ability, there's also another high chance that you can't even hit it, yeah. as far as I know. So uh, this is one of the hardest ships to kill in the game, it's not particularly well armed, but it's expensive enough um, that you can load it up with crew. I would probably. Oh, this is another one that uh, that has, what's a sea star would be useful for. Yeah, good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'd say a shipwright as well, possibly. Definitely something with world hater. You'd want a helmsman just to make it a bit faster. Yeah, this is probably up there with El Corzado for how hard it is to kill. Yeah, yeah. this one I would, with the good cargo, I would probably try to run her as a strange hybrid and just try to rely on the abilities to keep her safe. Maybe um, Captain Barbosa has, and Isandro Ramirez have Captain plus World Hater, and I would add a Helmsman. Uh, you could do something a little weirder than that, but I won't get into that. Um, uh, well, man, that's maybe that's worth talking about real quick. You could do Hammersmith for Captain Helmsman, the headhunter from South China Seas for World Hater and Sack, and then dump a bunch of oarsmen and try to make it like a like a powerful ship. Because then you could have 6S speed with six shots at 2S, 3S, 3S. So, kind of weird, but... Anyway. And it would be really hard to damage as well. Yeah, that would be pretty rough. Um, yeah, the, one, the guns wouldn't be excellent, but they'd be all right. Yeah, good enough for hybrid use or sort of... Uh, I will say I don't like this one because it would be a massive headache. So Wolf has already admitted that if this set was released, this would get a massive pirate code uh, entry because it's very confusing and kind of contradictory in some ways. I think I think somebody already asked a few rules questions when it came out, but um, this is another reason that you know it's not it's not the end of the world. We didn't see this set because this would be not only a big headache in terms of rules, it would be a headache to to use because You'd have to, so, you declare it the target of a shoot action, then you have to roll a die, and then, so if you don't roll low, you can shoot, so then you start shooting, but then, for every hit, the the controller of the orphan has to roll as well, so, just to shoot at it, and hit it, you have to roll at least three times, total, in terms of die rolls, and then if you've got, you're trying to shoot at it a bunch, it would just go up and up, so... It would just go into like a die rolling fest, like a, a dice rolling fest, which is pretty boring. So that's one of the reasons I don't like this one as much. It, it's quite intriguing, and I think obviously with the great group combos we just talked about, you could make her a, a weirdly fearsome gunship of sorts, or probably maybe a little bit better off as a hybrid that can really survive for quite a while. Uh, it's just a really annoying ship. I think, I, okay, so I haven't used this one yet. I think... If I do, I'm already anticipating basically hating it as much as the Bonaparte, because uh, how annoying it is. If not more. Yeah, yeah, potentially. So. I'll put a cancel on it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, um, something else I wanted to add, though. You said uh, something about turning it into a die rolling fest, but what are you doing playing this game if you don't like rolling die? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dice. Uh, anyway. Or you could, um, uh, you could get re-rollers. I guess the attacking player could have a re-roller, and then you could do that. Oh, my God. <laughs> You'd want about a million re-rolls every time you fight this thing, though. Yeah, and then for the catamaran, it says, each time the ship is hit, roll a d6. On a 5 or 6, it is ignored. So I guess, I'm assuming the controller of the double catamaran, in this case, would roll for that. So if the orphan had a re-roller, like the skipping stone does, you could re-roll... You could re-roll for the double catamaran. <laughs> and then they... Oh, and then they could have... If you were attacking with an English ship, you could have Rupert Hargreaves to re-roll 2d6 for every attack. 
Kirby <laughs> Cannon. Oh my god. So you could have, you could set easily set a record if you had an English ship facing the orphan with a bunch of those crew. You could set them. No oh, die rolls in one turn. Yeah, exactly. Or one shoot action, one action basically, and make it like an untouchable, unbreakable record, <laughs> and then get potions and brews to force an opponent to reroll. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it can almost become like a chess match because like. With potions and brews, you could try to figure out if you want your opponent to re-roll or not, and then like, and then they they use their re-roller right after that. <laughs> That'd be crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, it, and then ru- think... runes of Loki and Thor could get involved too. Oh no. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> I, I think this is one that oh. has to go into that episode yeah, of things yeah. to talk about at length. Yeah, I might not like this ship, but it is really funny to talk about. You could have yeah. Nemo's plans with potions oh, and no. brews to force rerolls on all of them. Until no, actually, basically, to, to kill this, you need Nemo's plan and runes of Thor. Yeah, until they just force reroll until they miss every time. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, let's skip on next to. Wait, was it your turn to start one? Uh, yeah, I did raise it, I guess. So yeah. Okay. All right, so I guess to pronounce Squalock is what I call it. It looks like I think you're right. A look. So there's an apostrophe. It's S S K W A apostrophe A L U K. It's cursed, yeah. which would explain that. Yeah, yeah, really bizarre. Um, I've got some a little, a few weird names like semi inspired from this in Epic Seas, but they're not quite as uh, impossible to pronounce. Um, so the curse get a very nice three masted wind catcher actually. So Squalock. Is 13 points, 3 mass, 5 cargo, L plus S move. Cannons are all 5L, but doesn't matter too much because it's got the wind catcher keyword. And on the turn, this ship is pinned. Eliminate one crew and one mass from the ram ship. So this one has gained some fame as one of the best cursed gold runners in the game, even if it was never released. So it would immediately go to the top or the number two spot after the grinder in terms of cursed gold runners if it was released, or you know, you can proxy it or use it on Vassal, of course. So, I'd say crazy. top because you've got space to do a helmsman without any real penalty if yeah. you're doing four gold per island. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. So great ship, and then with the extra ability she's got, she's actually got some potential too to defend herself decently. So and decent mm-hmm. durability for a gold runner. So a great ship overall. Yeah, I'd say uh, because of that ability, this is not actually a ship that you could go after using. A, any kind of support gunship because this would ram it and take away the uh, the captain, effectively killing its ability to pursue. So this is one you could really only kill the capital ship. Yeah. Or at least some sort of a some sort of a, uh, analog to that. Yeah. Or um, just, or hit her three times before she can move to pin herself. So. Boo. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say another reason for this being a better runner than grinder is because of the wind catcher ability, which allows you to measure from either end of the ship. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. and you could throw an oarsman aboard too, if you really want something to kind of mimic the turbine ability. Speaking of which we're about to get back into, because there are two turbines in this set. The first of which is a French ship. Uh, this is a, <laughs> I think it's pronounced Demoiselle. It's 12 points, 3 mass, as all turbines are, 4 cargo, L move, 4L, 3S, 4L, so not great guns. This ship can load cargo from a wild island if she's within S of it. So, uh, I'm going to say no thank you. It's like a turbine with a not-as-good version of the hoist ability. But also not fast, not great armament, slightly above average cargo space. Just no thanks. Not very good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's weirdly like meh. Pretty much all the other SCs here are at least interesting, if not good to great. This one is none of the above. Turbine keyword is fantastic, but she can't really. She's just not good enough at anything to be a good ship. So I guess I would do Captain Thompson, but. I wouldn't be very excited about it in, in like a huge game or something. So there might be it's some also like, It's also like one of the only French pieces in the set that's really eh, 
Yeah, yeah, they made out really well. Um, there might be some benefit to the loading cargo with an S that I'm not thinking of where you don't have to dock at the island. Um, maybe avoiding negative UTs or some kind of nasty volcanoes from, you know, Savage Shores. I don't know. Not really worth using for that, though. So, yeah, not a, not a great ship. Kind of a weird one. Um, the Americans are next, and they also got a turbine. USS Conscript is a three-master, of course, 13 points. Four cargo, S plus S move, cannons are 3S, 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 along with the turbine keyword. Uh, it says when the ship hits an enemy ship, you can also eliminate one cargo from that ship. So that, I call that cargo wrecking, and it's a fantastic, devastating ability, of course. Um, the Americans have okay named crew, not great. So I would do a Captain Helmsman, and I'm not sure what else I would do. It's She's okay. I used her, I think I, t I used her in CG3, I can't remember, but... She's, she's solid. I think she might be a little overrated from what I saw on the forum a while back, but still a solid ship overall. Yeah, yeah. this is... I, I mean, I don't think as overrated. I think baseline, what you've got is... I mean, Turbon is a decent keyword, but the ability of cargo wrecking, I think we can agree, is really good. Yeah. Um, this plus a few crew might make a really powerful, uh, interceptor slash possible hybrid. Yeah. I'd say the ability is too good not to use it as an offensive ship. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It has the speed, the ability, and the cargo hold to handle cargo, but the ability I would, because of that, stray away from, uh, filling this with gold. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Um, I just thought Brent, I didn't think of it before, but Brent Rice is the basic world hater she could have aboard. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe a cannoneer or something. If you're if you're only at one cargo anyway, might as well use it. Or maybe something to augment the cargo wrecking, make it like an overkill ship with fire pot or maybe great yeah. or something. That would be overkill. Yeah, this is a good candidate for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, next, uh, next up is, is, oh yeah, this one is my turn to start. This is a Spanish wind catcher and the last of the, uh, scavenger pack things, the last of the scavenger pack SEs. This is Babieca, I think it's pronounced. Yeah. Um, 13 points, three mass as all wind catchers are, five cargo, L move, three L, two S, three L guns, ignores the first hit she takes as long as she has all of her masts. I like that. This is a... This is definitely straight down the hybrid route. Uh, good cargo, good guns, and useful ability in both roles. Yeah. Not particularly fast, so I guess it's kind of stereotypically Spanish, but I like this. You can yeah. do a lot with this ship. Yeah, I love this one, actually. Reminds me of uh, of the Collector del Dia a little bit. Um, it's a very good ship overall. Like you said, you've got an ability... For fighting and for getting gold. So we've got defense ability, and then Windcatcher will speed her up um, away from Wild Islands, for example. So, yeah, I would do Captain Helmsman to start. That would be a, that would be enough. But you could also use Dominic Freda, of course, and various other good crew. Spanish have solid name crew options. So, yeah, it would be a decent candidate, I guess, for Master Bianco, some version of him, maybe even the Cargo Master from Savage Shores. So then you get maybe. some gold as well. But eh, anyway, yeah, that's it. Um, all right, so we're almost done. We're into the final few pieces here, which are the ten masters and linked crew. So number O five one is the Zanfu, and this is a mercenary ten master. So it's twenty five points, ten mast, six cargo, S plus S base move. Cannons are four L, three L, three S, three S, two S, two S, three S, three S, three L, four L. So a kind of symmetrical you know, back to front, a link to Huang Bai, and the abilities are Junk, Mercenary, and Dories, and American crew can use their abilities on this ship. So it might sound kind of familiar. These had the same theme as the Ten Masters from Savage Shores with the Shui Jian and Celtic Fury. Those had English and French slants, and here we've got American and Spanish slants here. So so it's almost like the Americans get a Ten Master in a way. It's not, that's not what it is, but it's similar. Um, this one is ridiculous because of the speed more than anything else. So S plus S speed on a 10 master, I think is borderline overpowered like automatically, or at least arguably. 
So for 25 points, uh, I think it's a bit too cheap, and I say that from experience. I use this one somewhat effectively in CG2 and then very effectively in Best of Community 3 just earlier this year. It ended in March, um, and my Americans won, and the Zanfu was some part of it, definitely. So SS on a 10 Master, that's just amazing speed to put on a ship that large, because you have to assume, I mean, obviously a Helmsman, so then you have a 10 Master moving triple S, which is great, and then what's awesome as well is I'm going to read the next one, Huang Bai, which is the Link Crew, because he can give it extra actions to make her go up to 6S, which is insane. So Huang Bai is a 5-point crew linked to the Zanfu, and his abilities are Expatriate, Hostile to Spain, and once per turn you can only one of the ship's crew to give it an extra action, so the sack ability... And then you've also got Island Treasure Trading. After looking at treasure on a wild island, you can trade any one treasure from that island for a random treasure on any other wild island. This ship must load the traded treasure. So the main attraction here is the sack ability. And just like with uh, Shepping's Eye from Savage Shores, we see it on Expatriate. So between these two sets, in, in, in effectiveness, every faction got two sack crew with this guy and Zai. So that's pretty insane and kind of overpowered in a way just in general but um but on the zanfu Wang Bai is great because he can make her a little bit of a hybrid but i would just sack is worth five realistically so i would i wouldn't really worry about the island treasure trading because i've usually crewed the zanfu up to be a monster gunship and with enough oarsmen a helmsman and a captain of some sort probably a named captain or something devastating um or get captain nemo aboard or a world hater like brent rice to make all the cannons better this basically means you're going to have, for no more than 50 points, you can have a 10 master moving 6S with 20 shots, which is amazing. So it's a great combo. Yeah, yeah. this is... Uh, I like my American stuff, so clearly I sort of wish the Zhenfu had been printed. Uh, unfortunately, that would come at the cost of some of these other OP items coming out. But I'd say the... The ship on its own is pretty solid. Um, Huang Bai is almost more important than Zhen Fu is because he would have given Sack and his miscellaneous abilities to so many other factions because he's technically, you know, expatriate mercenary. Um, Zhen Fu, I don't know, how would you say as as a Ten Master on its own it compares to Zeus? Um, I would say it compares decently well. Zeus is cheaper with obviously great crew selection, but Zanfu still has decent crew selection, and the speed, no other 10 master moves faster than L, so Zanfu is in a class of her own in terms of speed, which of course we know is the most important ship attribute in the game, basically. Yeah. Um, also, something I would want to see done with this is have somebody evaluate the use of Captain Charles Richard. Yeah, good point because you wouldn't have all that many spaces to work with, yeah. but being delimited, you could pick from the absolute best that the mercenaries and the Americans have. So yeah. you could have Peregrine Stern, yeah. you could have... Nemo. Oh. Yeah, Peregrine Stern, Nemo. Um, there's more you can do there. I'm not actually yeah. certain what offhand. This might be another... No, wait, no, Captain Charles Richard in general is one that belongs on the... Uh, on the discuss at length list. Um, yeah. Genfu, I'm not sure belongs, but it's still a competitive and respectable uh, 10 master. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beast. And you could use it in a 40 point game because captain and helmsman would be all you would need for a pretty devastating hybrid. And then you'd have, that'd be 30 points. I mean, that kind of shows it's overpowered from the start. Um, Cause then you could, Maybe get Perry involved to make it 45 points overall, or at least use 10 more points in a mixed faction fleet. This could be great at 40 points. I will admit, going back to the Zeus comparison, that's a good idea to compare them. The Zeus is a bit more viable at 40 points between the pirate crew and her cost being 2 points cheaper, but the Zanfu, I think in larger games at 60 points or 100 points or campaign games, I think you can make a decent case that the Zanfu would have been or kind of is the best 10 master because the speed is just so amazing to have on this large of a ship. So yeah, I, I think there's it. a good, you can really make a good case for that. Although, um, you can use, I think it's uh, rise of the fiends Griffin on, 
dang it, what's what was the tent master from Savage Shores that's basically English? Oh, the uh, Shui Jian. Yeah, that's what it was. Shui Jian, I think you could argue, is has more potential because you can throw uh, Rise of the Fiends Griffin on it, who can give plus S base move. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, and it's pretty tough for... It might actually be impossible to get that crew onto Jean Fu. Yeah, that sounds about right, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I know I've got a spreadsheet that could tell us this for sure, but I don't have time to open it because I've got to, uh, I think I've got to kick off with Fortaleza if you have nothing more to say that, about the Jean Fu. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. All right, Fortaleza is the last ship in the Return to Savage Shores set. This is another Ten Master. This one is effectively the Spanish option. Fortaleza is 25 points, 6 cargo, L move. 2L, 3L, 4S, 3S, 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 4S, 3L, 2L. There's a link to Vinicio Castillo. Junk Mercenary Dories, Spanish crew can use their abilities on this ship. And then Vinicio Castillo is what really gives the ship flavor. And he is Captain, Expatriate, Hostile America, places crew face up, reduce cost of all of the crew placed on the ship by one. So he is a strange combination of... So he's an expatriate mercenary, but he's a captain with two point reducer, which is, which I would say is kind of valuable on a ship yeah. this size if you're planning to crew it to the gills. Yeah, I agree. This is one but, I need to use more. I've hardly used. Um, I don't know if I've used Castillo yet, um, but overall, the Fortaleza is kind of not a, not nearly as good of a ten master, but with the combo. I think there are some potentially great crew setups that I've yet to discover. Yeah, I think I think I overall rated Fortaleza as not as good as Jean Fu, yeah. but still better than Celtic Fury, because as a whole, I think the Spanish have a much better selection of crew than the French do. I don't think it's way better. I think the French are always underrated for some reason, but but yeah, she's still solid overall. Um and yeah, this one I haven't used as much as the Zanfu. She showed up in uh, Vassal Campaign Game 2, but it was it was a weird situation where it was like a numbers 10 master. She just had a basic crew setup, actually, not too crazy. But I think with Castillo, you do have the potential to go pretty crazy. And the Spanish and the Mercenaries have plenty of expensive crew between them. So definitely some interesting setups you could look into. I find it kind of interesting that her best cannons are concentrated at the bow and stern. That does help the Fortaleza... Uh, in terms of getting the first shot, because her range is effectively longer with the 2L, 3L at the front, her effective maximum attack range anyway. And also, with 10 Masters, it gets a little awkward in terms of shooting, because it's, sometimes it's hard to get more than 5 or 6 cannons in range. So if you've got the 2L and 3L shooting first, that can be pretty <laughs> beneficial. So something like that could be uh, optimized with Stinkpot Shot or Firepot Specialist, stuff like that. So... Yeah, part of me wishes the L range guns were in the center, uh, because it's really tough to use the uh, S1s in the center, but at the same time, it's good to have the Ls on the end, so you can kind of have a, a dog bone shaped cone of fire, sort of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for point. Yeah. Um, uh, I think at some point I meant to do a 10 masted ranking thread, but that sort of fell apart because I... I've because work sort of invaded my life in a in a good way. I like I like what I do, but it meant that the uh, top ten list that I was posting for a long time stopped. Unfortunately, okay. yeah, uh -huh. yeah, still plenty anyway. of ideas left with that. But yeah, overall, I think it's a cool set. Um, similar mm -hmm. to Savage Shores, I think it. Mm, ah, I guess my gut feeling just right now is that it might be less balanced than Savage Shores. There's some crappy crew. yeah and uh and then you've got you know the fee two the zanfu the orphan and the even the plague of the south again she like breaks the cargo scale in my opinion but but anyway and then of course namazu is a, a really crazy cool sea monster so maybe maybe a little bit less balanced but a, a fun set another cool one and one that we would certainly enjoy if it was released i've already enjoyed it a bunch on vassal but i would i would highly recommend people try out these game pieces they are pretty fun uh to use but yeah i don't have too much more to say other than the questions which i'll hopefully remember finally i always forget the question of the day but yeah it, this one it really does run the entire range of 
terrible, utter trash game pieces that you wouldn't use to the broken stuff that you wouldn't want anyone to use. So uh, I do wonder what some of these would have looked like because I'm sure at least one of the not-so-great ships would have been at least partially redeemed by nice artwork, uh, which they really did step up with in Savage Shores. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I oh, got yeah, that on the of... screen, actually. Um, I was going to look at that a tiny bit. Thanks for reminding me, because I forgot about mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, in the top left, we've got Peregrine Stern from Savage Shores. It's just a mix of different artwork from SS and RTSS. Tribal Chieftain. And then I guess that's probably Sebastian Rojo, upper middle. And then mm -hmm. we've got uh, Della Flote and um, uh, Bianco. And then I guess bottom left, it should be George Washington LeBeau, mm -hmm. GWL at the bottom left with new artwork for him. And mm -hmm. I think it's Godiva. At the I head. do too. Yeah. And then of course the headhunter, obviously cool artwork for him. And then I guess probably Tobias Huntington is the lower right middle. Yeah. I think it was debated whether it, that was Tobias Huntington or yeah. some American crew. Yeah. I think that's my fault. Cause I think I thought it was somebody, but then Wolf made a good point that it was probably Huntington instead. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for a while I thought it was Pierce Hollow, but you pointed out Pierce is not actually a man. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Which surprised me, but. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, okay. So before I forget, um, questions of the day. I've got a handful here. So, do you like Return to Savage Shores? Do you wish it was released? Uh, do you like it more or less than Savage Shores if you compare the two sets? Have you used any Return to Savage Shores game pieces yet? And if so, how did it go? So those are the questions of the day that you can ponder. And uh, other than that, though, we're pretty much done here. And this also means that we're done with the with the set reviews in general. We do have a few little things at the end that we'll throw at you in future episodes. But this does wrap up the main set reviews. So it's nice to get those done, finally. It's been mm -hmm. going on for a while. So, yeah. All right. All right. So I guess this is us signing off for this episode again. Yeah.